Everyone realizes how laudable it is for a prince to keep his word and to live by honesty, not cunning. Nevertheless, we see from contemporary experience that those princes who have done great deeds have held their word in little esteem. They have known how to bewilder men's wits through cunning, and indeed have gotten the better of those who relied on sincerity. Therefore, you ought to know that there are two ways to fight, by using laws and by using force. Oh, hello, nerds. It is Halloween once again, which means it's time for me to dress up in my one Halloween outfit and talk about the spooky, scary things, such as authoritarianism. <laughs> if you haven't heard, there's a very big election coming up, and a lot of people are making videos where they're telling people to go vote. And you may expect me to do one of those videos too, but here's the twist. I won't. Or, I mean, kind of. I should say, I'm not going to comment on the current American election. I will not tell you who to vote for, for a couple of reasons, which I will talk about later. I am fair, I am balanced, I am Mia Mulder. Instead, I'm going to talk about the things that I think matter even more than the current ongoing American election, which to a lot of people is probably going to be. I know, we all want to go back to brunch, but even after this election, no matter who wins, there will be so many more important things to talk about. So, let's talk about it. Tonight we are going to talk about power, and why I, like most deluded, self-aggrandizing megalomaniacs, want it more than anything else. And more importantly, how to keep that power. Also, I know that a lot of you are tired about hearing specifically about US politics, because it almost seems like American politics are global politics these days, because news about American politics keep getting into my newsfeed, even though I don't even live in America. Although, to be honest, it is hard to avoid current events. I know, I don't want to do it either, but it's just a couple of days away, so we gotta. However, before we start talking about current events, we're going to talk about history. So I'm actually doing a bit of a mix of things. We're doing current events, we're doing politics, we're doing philosophy. Ooh. So at least I'm ripping off a couple of different YouTubers at this point. So, you know, how's that for diversity of thought? We're going to talk about power and democracy and why so many of us are starting to feel like democracy doesn't work anymore. Sure, democracy is more popular right now than it's probably been in most of human history. But it is definitely in danger. Two-thirds of American students are actively worried about the future of American democracy, and many polls throughout the democratic world show an increasing lack of confidence in democracy in general, which is very concerning if you've ever read history. But what is that going to lead to? And why is this happening? I mean. Are people gonna go back to worshipping queens and kings? Well, I certainly hope so. But to answer all of that, we kind of need to talk about what democracy is and what democracy isn't. And how to cheat democracy. If an injury has to be done to a man, it should be so severe that his vengeance need not be feared. Niccolo Machiavelli was an Italian diplomat and philosopher who is best known for his work Il Principe, or The Prince. Il Principe is a sort of treatise on how late medieval princes should act, especially new princes, who have recently acquired their kingdom by one way or another. Grossly oversimplified, a new prince is someone who doesn't have the trust of the people that he rules over. He lacks legitimacy. This is opposed to an old prince, which Machiavelli defines as someone who has perhaps inherited their princedom. Old here means the old system. Things don't change that much. But with a new prince, it comes with it a whole new system, a whole new form of rulership. And that brings with it certain challenges. You may have heard the term Machiavellian, which may invoke visions of treachery, political backstabbing, immoral acts, the end justifies the means. 
This is because Machiavelli argues that one of the most effective ways to solidify newfound power is through force and through violence. Machiavelli argues that using force is necessary because building legitimacy takes time and statesmanship, but using force can be done immediately and without a long-term dedication of resources. It is, in effect, easier if you don't have the legitimacy to already back you up. But only in a very specific way. You should still appear as if you act in a moral fashion. We can see this today at a great extent too, where in a lot of presidential campaigns and politics in general, people will make an attempt to seem more likable, or at least like they have good morals. And this works on the other side too, where we try to paint our political opponents as immoral rather than incompetent rulers. Everyone sees what you appear to be, few experience what you really are. In the days of Machiavelli, and even today to some extent, there is an expectation of our rulers, so to say, to act in a moral fashion. The idea is that if you have a moral leader, he will become a more effective ruler. However, it should be noted that Machiavelli isn't in favor of princedoms, as of course we today are not either. We are more in favor of democracy and republics, and Machiavelli was definitely a proponent of republicanism over princedoms in general. But the reason as to why I feel is very relevant to how things are going today, especially when it comes to American politics. Machiavelli argues that republicanism draws its strength from a diversity of ideas and diversity of thought. If Fabius had been king of Rome, he may easily have lost this war since he was incapable of altering his methods according as circumstances changed. Since, however, he was born in a republic, where there were diverse citizens with diverse dispositions, it came about that, just as it had a Fabius, who was the best man to keep the war going when circumstances required it. So later, it had a Scipio, at a time suited to its victorious consummation. This diversity allows a person to adapt to new situations, as the world changes, we need new ideas to deal with those things, and a prince can be slow to act and slow to adapt, but a group of people have a much larger base on which to draw solutions from. And as an added bonus, a prince can be awful, but a group of people are, on average, decent. But Mia, America is a republic, so the prince shouldn't have anything to do with how America runs its shit. Well, I guess. Here come the hot takes of today. America is barely a republic. I mean, just think about it. What is the presidency if not a controlled prince? In the last few decades, the power of the executive office has expanded dramatically, far beyond what has been the case of most historical republics. And this is made significantly worse by the fact that a large part of the House and Senate practically pay loyalty to either the president or the presidential candidate. And again, I'm not naming names, because this problem doesn't just affect the current American election. It is affecting all American elections, and it has been for some time. And this means that the safety of diversity of thought doesn't exist. There is one leader, and there is his followers. A large part of Machiavelli's work discusses of how to avoid flatterers, because flatterers don't actually make good governors or good advisors. One error into which princes, unless very prudent or very fortunate in their choice of friends, are apt to fall, is of so great importance that I must not pass it over. I mean in respect of flatterers. These abound in courts, because men take such pleasure in their own concerns and so deceive themselves in regard to them, that they can hardly escape this plague. And because people pledge loyalty to the president, rather than challenge the president, you end up with flatterers and not advisors. And so every four or eight years, you end up with a new, new prince. I think this is even more the case recently because America is becoming increasingly polarized. No matter who is the president, it seems that those who do not support that president have a hard time even seeing that president as legitimate in the first place. And so a new president is effectively 
conquering the other half of America that don't support them. This is why we see political militias. This is why we see this obsession with delegitimizing presidents, no matter what political party they belong to. And this means that new presidents are no longer given legitimacy by being voted in. They have to take that legitimacy. But how do you take legitimacy from someone that doesn't want to give it to you? A prince, therefore, need not actually have all the qualities I have enumerated. But it is absolutely necessary that he seem to have them. There's a lot of talk when it comes to politics about legitimacy and who is legitimate or not. In the current American election, there are many people who are worried about how a peaceful transfer of power will go. It's taken for granted today in a lot of democracies that the legitimacy of leadership is given from the consent of the people, which, sure, that's true, but it's also extremely new in world history. True, democracies are pretty recent, extremely recent, in fact. And historically, legitimacy didn't actually have anything to do with what the people thought. Practically, it meant having the consent of you know, your neighbors or some lords that were around you. If they supported your claim to the throne, then you were the leader. If they didn't, you probably got your head chopped off. For a long time in history, legitimacy was something that you derived not from the people, but from God. Okay, calm down. Obviously, the monarchs of yore didn't actually have consent from God to rule, or derive some sort of divine power in order to rule. But that's not what's actually important. And that's because the perception of legitimacy is far more important than legitimacy itself. However, we live in a modern society with democracy. Obviously, legitimacy doesn't come from God, it comes from people, because we have elections. And elections give legitimacy to people. However, that's only partially true. There's a misunderstanding that legitimate means legal. And that's not the case. Instead, I feel like a far better explanation of legitimate would be generally accepted, which, true, often coincides with what people consider to be legal. If you recognize a law as legitimate, you would reasonably also expect everything that comes out of that law to also be legitimate. So, if an election is fair and balanced, then whoever wins the election will be the legitimate winner. But sometimes that's not what's gonna happen. Yes, elections in most democracies pick the next elected representative, but it's not the result of an election that gives a leader its legitimacy. It is the structure that upholds that society. Basically, we have institutions in society now, and these institutions come with rules, written and unwritten, and depending on how a leader follows those rules, they will be seen as more or less legitimate. So sometimes it doesn't matter if a leader is democratically elected or not. If they don't follow the rules, they will still be seen as illegitimate. But if there is doubt on the election or of any step in the democratic process, the legitimacy of the candidate will also be put into question, even if there is plenty of evidence to show that the election itself was fully legal. And sometimes the legality of a candidate doesn't even matter. Sometimes political opponents can just decide to be entirely obstructionist and just refuse to grant legitimacy to other politicians within their own system. A president that has obstructionists opposing them are almost by definition seen as less legitimate than a president who wouldn't have to deal with those obstructionists in the first place. In this search for legitimacy, a lot of people will do things that they don't think that they would have to do. And to a lot of people, the moral virtues of an individual still matter a lot. And so politicians will attempt to appear moral and virtuous. Which means that sometimes politicians will take stances that they might not agree with in regards to moral questions such as LGBT rights, refugee status, asylum seekers, healthcare, abortion rights, and so on and so on. But this means that sometimes politicians with even the best of intentions may sometimes be forced to take a moral stance that they might not agree with just to try to gain legitimacy from people who are actively withholding it for whatever reason that they might have, valid or not. And this is true whether or not it happens on the right or on the left. 
And a lot of leaders can fall victim to this, even if they have the best intentions going into politics, because the system itself promotes this sort of thinking. And you may find yourself compromising on your most core values. You may find yourself committing deeply immoral acts. And you may find yourself at the head of a massively corrupt system. And you may find yourself in an awful political party with an awful political ideology. And you may ask yourself, how did I get here? It should be noted that all sorts of public figures have this sort of issue with legitimacy. It just has to do with different types of rules. These rules of legitimacy also apply on social media, which is why disinformation campaigns are so effective, because they cast doubt on the legitimacy of any single argument. And this can also apply to any sort of political system as well, not just individuals, which in turn damages the legitimacy of any political candidate no matter how legal or illegal their election or rise to power actually is. Even social media figures such as YouTubers have to derive some sort of legitimacy from somewhere. Not me though. I don't derive my power from the people. I, like the queens before me, derive my people from God himself. And in the words of that God, thank God for me. But what do you do if someone remains in power despite having almost no legitimacy at all, whether it is from within the system or in fact from the people. Well, this is exactly the reason why Niccolò Machiavelli proposes to use force. But you don't actually need to suppress the people. You just need to make the people think that you have the power to defeat them. Because if the people think that they have no hope in rising up against you, then they're not even going to try. It's the same principle when it comes to the divine right of kings. There's no point in rising up against someone who has been ordained by God. You can't defeat God after all. And so there's no point to even try. And so if you can use force efficiently enough, you don't even need legitimacy in the first place. However, history has shown us that this usually leads to something else. You need a good old revolution. Call up the French, it's time to bring out the guillotines. Ha, huh. the solution to all of our problems. A revolution. Or maybe a coup. Who's to say the difference anymore? This is also the part of the history books that get real exciting and also difficult. But first, let's define some terms. As we mentioned previously, we have the political system and structure that exist that can give us legitimacy if we need it. A coup is when you replace the political leadership without replacing the system that upholds it. Whereas a revolution is dismissing the system entirely and replacing it with something new. It should be noted that both of these things can happen peacefully, although they usually don't. I think there are a lot of people who, in the face of deepening distrust towards democracy, sort of romanticize the idea of having a revolution to sort of restore a proper society, or to create one that maybe hasn't existed before. Especially if you want to resist authoritarian leaders, and perhaps an authoritarian system. If you believe that you have no other option, you may think that a revolution is probably the best bet that you have. But there are some problems with that. However, it should also be said that these terms can be applied a bit loosely. Like, Bernie Sanders says that he wanted to have a political revolution, which, you know, I don't think he wanted to abolish the Senate. If he did, that would be, uh, poggers. But it is possible to have a revolution, completely peacefully and legally, without having to resort to any sort of violence at all. In fact, Aristotle just defined revolution as changing one's constitution, which people do all the time. However, these peaceful revolutions mostly occur when the system is either willing to change or the leadership wants to change it. And a lot of the time, that just doesn't happen. It just has a bad connotation because someone chopped off one too many heads one time Boo hoo. And historically, revolutions happen with a lot of people involved in them. Like, a lot of people. Because if you're going to change the entire political system that is currently around, then you're gonna need a lot of people to support you doing that. And also to enforce the new system that you're going to replace the old one with. 
understandably, a lot of people are going to be used to the old system and don't want change. But this is where coups come in, and that's more complicated. You see, it's far easier to remove a few select individuals than it is to remove an entire system of bureaucracy. All you need to do is mess with some individuals, and suddenly you have a lot more power than you used to have. This is where it's important to mention, and something to be extremely wary about, that you can coup yourself. There have been people both on the left and the right in the last couple of decades that have suspected and speculated that a democratically elected president, at least according to the rules, will attempt to coup themselves into even more power. And these suspicions are now happening again in this election. But they're not new fears. During Obama's presidency, a lot of Republicans were terrified that Obama was going to invade the southern states. And while those concerns may not have been very reasonable, it doesn't change the fact that people actually had those concerns in the first place. There is a perception that a coup can only happen when an outside force tries to depose a sort of democratically elected leader, but that's not at all the case. For example, it is extremely possible, and has happened in history, that a democratically elected leader is using illegal means to secure more power for themselves, a self-coup where you use untraditional or illegal means to attain more power or to remain in power. And I'm sure that's not going to be relevant real soon. While a coup is easier to pull off than a revolution, a coup is also easier to stop. Because a coup relies on the already existing system of power that they're trying to take over, it means that it is a lot easier to disrupt that system. And if you disrupt that system, suddenly a coup isn't as effective anymore. Because the system they need to exert the power doesn't work. This is not the same as thing as a revolution where you completely change the system. You're merely turning it off for a bit. At least until you can organize some more effective resistance. A coup will most often try to legitimize itself using the system that they have access to. And so by limiting the coup's access to those systems, the coup is undercut. Notice that these are almost the exact same methods people use to delegitimize political figures in normal politics as well. You can be obstructionist to a democratically elected president, just as you can be obstructionist to a coup. They're both as effective in shutting down the state apparatus. It's worth pointing out, though, that coups and revolution rarely actually work. We think they work, because we remember the ones that actually do work out and make it into history. But the ones that don't are either forgotten, or they're remembered as terrorist organizations. And once you start using force and violence to achieve your political goals, even when you have a good reason for doing it, it's very hard to put a genie back in the bottle. The French Revolution turned to extreme violence extremely quickly once established system and rules lost their legitimacy. And while a revolution can have justifiable reasons and causes, unless a secure system takes its place, whatever system that might be, movements will be forced to turn to even more violence. However, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily a bad thing to prepare for. Planning to defeat a coup before it happens, or planning to overthrow an unjust ruler, either with revolutionary measures or counter-coups, can reduce the chance of a coup even happening in the first place. Just as a leader can discourage revolt with the perception of force, so can a population discourage coups and power grabs with a similar perception of their own. And this doesn't have to go all the way towards extreme violence. It can take the shape of protests, general strikes, and so on. And we must actually properly prepare to enact those actions before they become required for them to be effective as a deterrent. Otherwise, it'll be too late. And then there are even fewer options available. And that's when things often turn from bad to worse. Because, like Machiavelli argues, those that turn to violence and force will most often be more successful than those who don't. Especially when legitimate means either no longer exist or become possible. And we don't want violence or force. And that's why we need to stop living under the influence of a system that makes it that we...
But that's and that's why we need to stop living under a system that enables us to have princes in the first place. And this brings me to one of the best ways to undercut a coup. Voting. But what if voting doesn't do that, actually? Because of recent and current events, let's talk about voting. You have probably seen endless YouTube videos, Twitter posts, Instagram posts, politicians, you, live streams, talking about the fact that you need to go vote. Vote now. Register to vote. Ah. And I'm going to say that too. But with some heavy, heavy caveats first. We live in a society where you can vote, and so it is a tool that is available to you. And that can be practical for a lot of different reasons. But something that a lot of people don't want to talk about, especially in an election year, is why do so many people not vote? And before anyone starts claiming something in the comments, I will say, if you can vote, you should. But for a lot of my viewers, especially in America, your vote does not matter. At least in some respects. What I'm referring to here is various types of voter suppression, such as gerrymandering, the electoral college, the fact that felons can't vote in a significant amount of states, even down to the fact that you only have two political parties. The very foundation of how American politics functions makes it so that your options are significantly limited even when the system is working perfectly. I feel like this is extremely important to talk about, especially in an election year, because when else are we going to talk about it? If nothing is done to fix the fact that for many Americans your vote doesn't matter, the problems that are currently happening in American politics will just keep happening. It's not like anything significantly has changed in the fundamental ways people vote in the last couple of decades. This is the system sort of working as intended, which means that no matter who wins the next election, and the one after that, and the one after that, things will keep going bad. The reason why a lot of people want to avoid these conversations is because it can lead to political apathy, which I've talked about before. If people feel like it's hopeless to go vote, then they're more likely not to vote at all, which just makes the flaws inherent to the system become worse and worse and worse. However, that is also exactly one of the reasons why some people choose not to vote at all. To boycott a broken system. The idea is that the flaws would become so obvious that people would have no choice but to change it fundamentally. Or at least talk about doing it. Because right now, almost no one is talking about major electoral reform. At least among major party figures. Because by voting, you give legitimacy to a system that maybe doesn't deserve that legitimacy in the first place. And I think it's understandable to see where they're coming from. There is almost no incentive for people in power to change the way they got into power in the first place. This is why Democrats and Republicans both partake in various amounts of voter suppression. And while I think that one party does it a bit worse than the other one, the problem lies in the system that allows any political party to do it in the first place because it is this system that is currently making America vulnerable to the problems that I mentioned before. And voter suppression is one of the immoral ways an illegitimate president can remain in power. Voter suppression is a type of force, because you're forcing people in a position where they can't vote you out. And this leads to the entire system losing legitimacy as a whole. And I should also say that I don't think you're going to convince a lot of people who have chosen not to vote to go and do that by sort of demeaning their political position. For example, I've seen a lot of people say that people who don't vote simply don't care or are completely delusional about why they choose not to vote. I don't think that's true. These people have a rationale, at least most of them, and we have to respect that rationale, even if I believe it is a bit flawed. However, with all of that said, you should still go and vote. Like, I'll be honest, I think that most political options here are pretty bad. Where I come from, Sweden, both candidates seem extremely right-wing. However, I'm fairly sure that you, just as I, think that one of these candidates is a far better alternative than the other one. And if you don't know which one I'm talking about, 
then I think you should get better acquainted with my content, which is why I'm not gonna tell you who to vote for. And that's for a couple of reasons. A lot of you have already voted early, which I think is a pretty good thing. Second of all, most of you who haven't voted probably already know who you are going to vote for. And third, those of you who don't know who you're going to vote for, I very much doubt that you're going to be very much convinced by one trans YouTube video. My biggest takeaway is that you should vote, but voting isn't going to fix the fundamental problems that led America to this point in the first place. Instead, you should pressure politicians to advocate for major electoral reform, forcing politicians to commit to change the way districts work so that we can avoid gerrymandering, restoring voting rights to ex-felons, for example, and, of course, the big one, abolishing the electoral college. Because otherwise, we are going to end up with a system where every 48 years, a new prince will conquer half of America and will have to fight in order to gain the legitimacy of, of that half. And that is a very unsustainable system, and it won't work for long. And as it stands right now, things are getting worse, not better. Electoral reform seems to be the most crucial issue that American politics will have to deal with outside of climate change. And right now, it feels like almost no one is talking about it. And maybe it's time that you should. And so we end up here, with the powerful becoming more powerful and using more treacherous and treacherous ways in order to hold on to that power. But of course, we live in a society and power, for me at least, is a lot based in money, because the power of affording rent is a very good power to have. And I'm very happy to offer you the power of knowledge, thanks to my sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives, where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. I can personally recommend the Productivity Masterclass, because God knows I need that in these very stressful times. Normally, you can get Skillshare for less than $10 a month, but the first thousand people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. And so, learn. Vote. Both good things. So I proclaim. Now go on. Thank God for me. <laughs> and with that, I hath won my bread, and you may hath cake. So go eat cake and go vote. Thank you for watching that video. I hope you liked it, and if you want to see even more of my content, you can go to my channel. You can also subscribe and hit the bell, leave a like and a comment. All of those things very much help the channel. If you want to support my work financially, you can go to patreon.com slash miamulder and help me out there too. I want to give a special thanks to Twelve Tone, Lots of Lottie, and Valentina for helping me with the voice clips for this video. Reading Machiavelli is fun, but it is also like reading Machiavelli, and I don't want to do it on my own. I want to give another special thanks to Aini Salminen, Alicia Crawford, Alki Historiker, Amalia, Amanda B, Athiet, Austin K, Autumn, Catherine Stenson, Christine Gutierrez, Cobra Sphere, Dana Ferguson, Danin Gollan, Emil Rutkowski, Emilia Clark, Aaron Kitchen, Ezekiel Panepucci, Fox Kant, Jade C, Jane Lusby, Janel Torgerson, Jareth Arnold, Jim Sterling, Jörgen Danielsen, Joshua Analik, LPQ Silver, Linus 2.0, Michaela, Morimer, Mountain Snow, Natalie Kapoor, Nia Pesaka, Nork 426, Pat, Phobos 2390, Riley Knox, Safi Haq, Salmon Moose, Zitzries, The Bread Santa, Thoros of Mir, Tiffany A, William Fuhassel, Ultimate Sanctibus, Rosie, Vinder, Vivian Crow, Wolfgang the Grand High Exalted Wizard, and Soya Kant. And to all the other patrons as well.